Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Elena Purmel, and unfortunately, I only can join by phone. I'm engineering director at the HDF Group, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker and my colleague, Gert Heber. Uh, Gert is an application architect at the HDF Group, and he will give us today an introduction to HDF 5 in HPC environments. Before we start, I just would like to mention that everyone except the speaker will be muted during the talk, and you will have opportunity to ask questions using Q&A panel that you have when you start that webinar. We will try to answer the questions during the talk, but probably mostly we will answer them during the Q&A session that we will have at the end of the webinar. And uh, since time is limited, we may not be able to answer all questions, but uh, we will collect all of them and we will answer them. We will post the document with the answers along with the webinar recording and we will send you a link. Uh, it will take maybe a few days, but all answers uh, will be there. So with this, let's start. Thanks, Elena. Um, welcome uh, to this introduction to HDF5 and HPC environments. My name is Gerd Heber. Thanks for attending this webinar. Uh, my apologies for the technical shortcomings of this setup. Uh, there is a technical glitch in the uh, webinar software, and I'm actually unable to advance the slides uh, from my computer, but I'm kindly assisted by my colleague, uh, Lori Cooper. Um, this is an introduction covering a wide range of topics, and of course, it will be a mixture of material that you know um, as well as new content. Uh, given the short duration of this tutorial, uh, please consult the resources listed near the end of this presentation or attend, I encourage you to attend a uh, future tutorial event because this is a, an introduction and not a tutorial. Next slide, please. Um, Oh, ah, yeah, uh, there's a little bit of a lag here for me uh, in uh, the screen update. Okay, we, we begin this presentation um, with a few basic questions and explore how HDF5 might be related uh, to some of the data management problems you have encountered already. We will show you um, how to be productive with no or very little knowledge about HDF5. And then we will build on that intuitive understanding and work our way straight into sort of the realm of HPC IO with HDF5. And we will conclude with an overview of the essential HDF5 resources and some guidance on how to take your mastery of HDF5 to the next level. Next slide, please. Okay, um, why do we need something like HDF5? Short answer is because there's plenty of complex data. Um, and uh, good news is we are not alone in this. And you will see that HDF5 fundamentally is a community effort. Next slide, please. Um, this is an overview of what you will know at the end of this presentation. Of course, since knowledge does not automatically translate into an ability to apply and practice that knowledge, it is vital uh, to get a sense of productivity early on. Once you've taken that hurdle, um, there should be a clear path to developing and refining your HDF5 skills. And this is as much a goal of this introduction as anything else we have mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, let's look at something uh, with which most of us uh, will be familiar. Next slide. Okay, as problem solvers, um, we detest spending a lot of time on non-problem oriented issue. We enjoy simple and straightforward mechanisms such as Python's uh, pickle approach to persistence. It just works. It has its limitations, um, but it serves as a good model uh, for getting stuff done. Next slide, please. Um, we have little control often. We, we have little control over the size or object count, 
uh, that life throws at us. Um, take the example of a machine learning training set uh, where we often see small objects, but lots of them. Obvious questions are, well, what can be done? Um, do we have any options and what are they? Next slide, please. Of course, uh, turning ideas into bytes, that's the subtitle of this uh, introduction, um, is a process that's fraught with ambiguity and without additional objectives or constraints, uh, there's just not enough information to qualify one or the other proposal as more or less suitable or even optimal. Uh, next slide, please. Without having told you anything about HDF5, here's kind of a heads up. HDF5 embraces ambiguity, that ambiguity that's in this mapping from ideas to bytes, and it can accommodate many mappings of the same idea or ideas into bytes. Portability um, stood at its cradle, at the cradle of HDF5, and longevity is part of our mission. Our mission. Um, HDF5 is what it is through its community and ecosystem, and really its limits are the limits of HDF5. Next slide, please. Um, zero knowledge HDF5 productivity may sound like a contradiction in terms, but we will spend the next few minutes to show that this is as real as zero day exploits. The elegance of modern scripting languages combined, uh, combined with the skill of community members in creating language bindings for HDF5 can work marvels. Uh, you see here an example uh, taken from the introduction to Andrew Collette's book, Python and HDF5. As an example, it uses a weather station recording temperature and wind speeds. And without going into details, it's all standard Python fair, dictionary accesses, NumPy slicing and dicing. Um, if you are coming to this webinar though, uh, through the Exascale computing project, you might have reservations about Python at that, at, at, at that scale. Next slide, please. Uh, what about a in the words of its own creator, a uh, new language. Next slide, please. Uh, as it has happened many times in the past, the HDF community has risen uh, to challenges like that. And Stephen Varga's H5CPP is a perfect example uh, of that spirit. Its values uh, are in the best C++ tradition and uh, speak for themselves. H5CPP comes with batteries included. For example, if you are a machine learning researcher, um, to create yet another way to persist linear algebra structures in HDF5 is not really a good use of your time. I would say just H5CPP pickle it <laughs> and, and just say that fast five times. Uh, next slide, please. So remember Pickle um, uh, in Python with H5CPP, uh, persisting C++ objects can really be as simple as persisting uh, Python objects with Pickle. Um, the key difference or one of the key differences uh, is that um, these objects go straight uh, to an HDF5 file where they can then be picked up by the same application or R or Python or Julia, et cetera. Now, um, one persisted C++ object, of course, does not make a whole persistence solution, but here is this uh, weather station example uh, with H5CPP and um, whatever HDF5 API there might be, it really blends into the language so that it practically disappears. Next slide, please. Uh, 
There is another important part to H5CPP that we cannot cover here, which is compiler assistance. But if you are interested in this topic, I, uh, you should consider registering for an upcoming webinar of the Toronto C++ user group, which is dedicated to this very topic. And it will take place on the 30th of June. And um, at the end of this presentation, or you can post a question, we are happy to share that link with you uh, uh, for that event so that you can register. And registration is free, of course. Um, next slide, please. Now, zero knowledge productivity, I hope uh, I have shown is real and is at your disposal in many popular languages and environments. Um, I personally haven't given up hope uh, for high productivity C and Fortran interfaces, and maybe there's even somewhere in this audience uh, who wants to take up that challenge. Um, with that out of the way, let's, let's take a closer look at HDF5 itself. Um, in speaking about HDF5, we can't really avoid metaphors. And this can be helpful, uh, but this can also be dangerous. Next slide, please. Um, HDF5 things, in double quotes, have an affinity to files and on the whole have the appearance of file systems. We can store arrays and access them like dictionaries as well as slice and stride through them. Next slide, please. Here's the schematic um, of the contents of an HDF5 file. Um, apparently, um, it's about certain primitives and their arrangements. Next slide, please. Okay, let's, let's break down um, the one sentence definition, if you wish, at the top, uh, which basically says that an HDF5 file in double quotes is a rooted decorated web of array variables. Well, um, file is put in quotation marks because file is not strictly speaking uh, part of the HDF5 data model. There's nothing in the HDF5 data model that says there shall be files. Um, as in mathematics, variable and function are among the most important concepts in HDF5 um, with a slight variation in computer science uh, people tend to call grid functions arrays, um, and they have the usual characteristics such as the, the element type of an array, uh, its rank, its dimensionality, and uh, its extent. Um, finally, in HDF5, we distinguish between uh, arrays representing heavyweight, if you want to call it that data, and in HDF5, we call them data sets, and arrays that uh, represent metadata, and in HDF5 we call them attributes, but either way they are both, in a general sense, array variables. And that's really all there is to the HDF5 data model. Next slide, please. Um, these are the things that HDF5 users do most of the time. Um, HDF5 items can be conveniently referenced by names, path names, attribute names, things of that nature. And uh, there is an extensible uh, type system that shouldn't really leave much to be desired as far as types are concerned. But in, the, in an upcoming webinar where we will talk more about types, uh, uh, we will also emphasize that uh, like like a, like salt, it is something that you shouldn't use in huge quantities when you prepare meals. Um, and slicing and dicing, of course, these generalized uh, block access operations are pretty much the bread and butter uh, for any HDF5 user. Next slide, please. Uh, in summary, for this section, HDF5 is probably smaller than it is sometimes made out to be. And uh, I think, yeah, let's, let's get on with HPC.
Okay, by parallel HDF5 in this context, we mean HDF5 or the HDF5 library more specifically compiled uh, with support for MPI IO enabled. And uh, so let's just recap maybe uh, the basic structure of an MPI program. This shouldn't really come as a shock. Um, it's all about having something uh, people in MPI land call a communicator, but it's an MPI world that has a certain size and zero to size ranks. And uh, we would like to do something with HDF5 in that world with those parameters and those coordinates. Next slide, please. As a quick recap, um, parallel I.O. is really all about parallel access paths and your ability uh, to utilize them. Um, uh, processes, MPI processes, may or may not coordinate uh, in their I.O. activities and uh, we distinguish there between uh, independent and collective I.O. modes. Um, it can also be done uh, in uh, different process and file constellations. So uh, you could have each process writing to a separate file, or you could have uh, all processes writing to the same file, or um, some kind of end-to-end mapping where uh, the number of processes typically is greater uh, than the number of files that uh, you're writing, your application is writing to. And of course, there is a lot going on under the covers, um, all kinds of optimizations and tricks and techniques to cope uh, with uh, I.O. workloads. And um, there is plenty of room for optimization, but at the same time, unfortunately, uh, that room uh, for optimization also creates the space for things to go wrong. Um, next slide, please. In this figure, um, we used sort of different colors and textures um, to represent uh, different data set regions um, written by different MPI processes. And this figure uh, depicts the view from the vantage point of MPI process one. In this case, MPI process one or rank one will attempt to write a two by five, two rows, uh, five column block of data at offset two zero, so row offset two, column offset zero, into a global four by five data set. And, oh, no, it's, it, it, is it, no, it's, it's actually eight by five, I apologize, eight by five data set, I have that wrong here. Yeah, that's, that's what's depicted here. So before we look at the general parallel case, let's look at what this would uh, be in, in sequential uh, programming terms. Next slide, please. Um, with, with H5C PP, we can actually achieve this um, in a few lines. Um, uh, the in a parallel version, of course, um, we would need to be aware of that MPI world, so to speak, and we would have to adjust it to the needs uh, of a specific rank. But the, the, the general outline or the general structure is the same. We, we have a local array or, uh, of, of some dimension. Uh, what really counts is the, the number of elements that we have. They are not so much the rank. We will initialize it hopefully with something useful, uh, create that HDF5 file, and then write to it at the appropriate uh, offset, the appropriate number of elements. Next slide, please. Making the transition to parallel at a syntactic level is actually uh, the easy part. Um, there are really only two changes uh, that make all the difference here. Uh, first of all, um, we will need to instruct the HDF5 library to use MPI IO, and that happens on line nine 
in this example where we've just thrown in an additional argument that instructs the HDF5 library uh, to use MPI-IO instead of the default uh, POSIX. And um, the second change is, uh, as we said earlier, now that uh, different ranks enter into the picture on line 13 uh, when we uh, specify that offset, um, we have to take the rank of the MPI process into account. But that's really it, two changes. Um, it otherwise looks pretty much exactly the same as a sequential program. And uh, another little detail to point out that adds to convenience is um, you, you will notice that we've just created sort of a, a standard uh, SDL, standard template library uh, vector uh, as, as a one-dimensional thing. And we are writing uh, to a two-dimensional data set. And again, that's no problem. It's just convenient. And uh, there's nothing that prevents you uh, in HDF5 from writing to or reading from um, uh, sort of array type constructs uh, of different ranks. As long as the numbers, the, the count of elements add up, um, there's no problem there. Next slide, please. Now, um, you, you, you may notice um, or, or a few questions may just pop into your mind. Number one is, is there any difference between sequential and parallel HDF5 files? And the answer is no. Uh, there is only one HDF5 file format and um, uh, th there is really nothing uh, that uh, uh, distinguishes the two and you can't really tell. If somebody gives you an HDF5 file, and then you would like to do some detective work uh, to find out if that file was written sequentially or in parallel, that's, that's rather futile. There, you won't see a difference. Um, secondly, uh, as we said earlier, um, different MPI processes uh, can uh, uh, coordinate uh, their I.O. activities or go about it in, a, in an independent fashion. The default behavior for H5CPP is that this happens independently, but then uh, to trigger or to instruct H5CPP and in turn the HDF5 library to use collective I.O. is very easy. You just add this H5 uh, scope collective hint and uh, that will uh, hopefully uh, make the right things happen. Uh, now, of course, um, your colleagues, collaborators, friends uh, uh, will still say that uh, parallel I.O. is hard and they certainly have a point. Next slide, please. Um, here is a picture taken from, an, from a nice paper that sort of illustrates why uh, just addressing uh, if you wish, at a syntactic level, the challenge of parallel I.O. is not sufficient because there are many other layers between your application and the, the, um, uh, the supercomputer or the cluster hardware. And um, on the one hand, you might say uh, there are numerous opportunities for optimization, but as a cynic, again, you might say that uh, there's plenty of uh, things that can go wrong along the way. Just to give you a very simple example, frequently just misplaced assumptions about system defaults um, are a common cause for performance problems. For example, we keep talking about collective I.O. and it's certainly true that um, your installation will have certain default values for these buffer sizes and aggregator counts and so forth. But there is actually a very high probability that your application is one of the applications uh, for which those defaults are actually not appropriate. And uh, so you, you might run into problems right there, but that's just the nature of it. So um, the, the obvious question is, what can we do about that? And can we be systematic about uh, discovering uh, simple, uh, problems like that. Next slide, please.
So um, we can guard ourselves against issues like that uh, by applying methods consistently, applying a process consistently, and um, typical steps um, in applying such a method would be um, you, you definitely need a clear understanding or good understanding of your target system's characteristics and capabilities. Um, you want to create some kind of baseline for your application and uh, collect the associated data from profiling and tracing tools. And then um, if uh, that performance is not satisfactory, you, you want to formulate uh, a few hypotheses um, about what could be wrong and then have some ideas uh, which configuration changes might affect an improvement in performance. And um, uh, based on the change in behavior, you can then confirm or reject, or unfortunately in some cases, uh, if the data that uh, you get in return is inconclusive, you might have to put a hypothesis aside. What's challenging here is really that since this will happen in an iterative or incremental way is uh, to really know when to terminate that loop. So not to digress uh, uh, into, onto a path of diminishing returns. And so in, in the better circumstances, you just have a finite budget. And when, you're, when your budget is exhausted, that's when you stop. But uh, it's, 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 it's trickier than it may sound. And uh, yeah, the, I, I, I can't offer any, any magic bullet there. Next slide, please. Okay, um, to apply this method, uh, for example, to establish the target system's characteristics, um, that work has typically been done for you. Um, these, these large machines that you are using, for example, uh, they are typically not bought by private individuals that then go through the process of uh, understanding what they've what they've just gotten themselves into. There is a formal process uh, that vendors undergo uh, when uh, their systems are procured. There is an acceptance test and there's a report, and and that's probably good enough. Um, but um, if you would like to do your own experiments, there, there are plenty of uh, ways to do that, um, tools such as the flexible I.O. tester or FIO or uh, IOR benchmarks like that, that let you establish the parameters or characteristics um, that you might be interested in for your application. As far as baselining your application goes, it can be as simple as doing a back of the envelope calculation. So based on the characteristics that you don't do have now and the knowledge about the um, uh, I.O., the amount of I.O. and so forth that your application does, you can come up with simple estimates that tell you this is what I should be getting based on what I, mo I know my system is capable of doing and what my application presumably is doing. And um, then you, you would just pick a typical set of inputs that are representative of the uh, uh, production workload of a production workload and use a tool such as Darshan or Tau, uh, if you are more interested in the tracing, um, to collect data that represent the baseline of that behavior. And uh, since the uh, uh, our vision is kind of our sharpest tool, uh, it pays and most of these tools uh, come with very helpful uh, visualization capabilities to just uh, plot uh, the uh, this baseline and um, once you have seen a few of these examples and you know how to read histograms like that and so forth in 80 percent of the cases you have your first hypothesis or in some cases your first low-hanging fruit uh, for improvement right there in front of your eyes next slide please Um, and then as you, and I use Darshan here as an example, uh, learning how to then uh, interpret and read um, profile or tracing information like that is definitely 
uh, time well spent. And you will put together your own list of usual suspects, if you wish, that, um, again, I would say in 80% of the cases, when you see a profile, um, those are the things that you are looking for and uh, to have sort of your first potential improvement or optimization targets. It is true, however, that in maybe 20% of cases, and your mileage may vary, um, that information is inconclusive. You don't find any of your usual suspects. And then, um, you're, unfortunately, you have to work harder. You have to look at um, less aggregate, more detailed, more time sequenced information. And um, that requires more work, but um, that's, that's the nature of the beast. Uh, next slide, please. All right, um, what's the takeaway? Um, the HDF5 library makes parallel applications and data portable, and that's that's a good thing. Uh, so if uh, a new machine comes around uh, in two years or uh, uh, you are moving to the cloud into an HPC environment based in the cloud, um, as far as portability goes, there's nothing really that you have to change. And tools such as H5CPP make it convenient. As far as performance is concerned, portability is more of an aspiration. And uh, the reason is not um, that uh, there's something wrong fundamentally with your application or any of the layers. It's really the combinations, the layer cake that just leaves gaps and cracks and uh, assumptions that um, uh, lets things go wrong sometimes, but um, you can arm yourself with method and the right tools. And um, we actually have uh, tutorials in preparation and uh, so stay tuned for the announcements uh, more um, uh, on point uh, for these uh, tracing uh, profiling related topics. Now, where do you go from here? Next slide, please. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, we've we, we've we've made a lot of mistakes, and uh, 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 but on the other hand, we hope we hope that uh, that's an encouragement to you to learn from our mistakes, and because it's it's uh, after a while, <laughs> once you've made. So, uh, quite a few of them, it's actually pretty difficult to make original mistakes. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, I think here is a nice list of the uh, uh, sort of go-to HDF5 resources, beginning with, I, I would like to put an emphasis sort of on the visual, just to understand what you are looking at. Um, Today, every operating system, desktop, notebook ships uh, with some kind of file explorer. And HDF view, if you wish, is the HDF5 file explorer at that level. It just lets you look at the stuff to understand uh, what the stuff is that you have in the cloud or on your local hard drive or something like that. Uh, HDF view is that tool. Um, the, the slides and examples from this presentation will be available on GitHub uh, to you very soon. And uh, you can learn more about the HDF group uh, and its mission uh, from our website. If you need uh, support, um, if you would like to report a bug, for example, um, you would like to look at the uh, developer documentation at a user's guide, um, information of that kind, uh, please go to the HDF support portal. But even before you do all that, and maybe you're not quite convinced yet uh, that HDF is the thing uh, that's right for you, I encourage you to watch um, a few very high quality training videos. Uh, I personally believe they, that they were put together by professional, they were professionally produced also by people that um, are good teachers and trainers, unlike myself. Uh, and uh, it's it's very much worth your time uh, to watch these videos. Um, uh, we haven't really talked much about whole applications 
uh, use cases, industries, uh, disciplines of science and so forth where HDF5 is being used. And a good starting point might be the HDF5 blog um, uh, where you can uh, get a quick overview, although not exhaustive, um, of uh, what uh, people have done with HDF5. Uh, since HDF5 has been around uh, for almost 20 years, um, there's a tremendous body of presentations uh, and so forth available online, for example, on SlideShare, and uh, that's another great resource. Um, if you would like to connect uh, with the HDF community, then I believe the HDF forum is a, is a great venue for that. Um, uh, you can ask very detailed uh, technical questions if you get stuck and so forth. There's a very good chance that someone out there will have run into a similar problem and uh, knows the solution and will gladly assist you in, in uh, making progress. Um, also, uh, things evolve quickly here. So as far as software releases go, as far as events like this go, announcements, um, where people talk about HDF5, uh, like this um, uh, C++ webinar, for example, or communities that are not necessarily focused on HDF5, it's worthwhile subscribing to the HDF newsletter just to be aware of what's going on. And uh, last but not least, there is a vast HDF ecosystem out there. Many third-party vendors have integrated HDF5 into their products. There are community standards, industry standards, and so forth. And um, we can't even maintain a complete list of all of that, but our modest attempt uh, can be found at this hyperlink uh, HDF5 ecosystem. And um, I encourage you, uh, if you come across something that you do not see on that list, but you think would be worthwhile sharing with the community, please uh, contact the help desk and share that link, that information with them so that we can add it. Next slide, please. Um, what do you need to get started with HDF5? So let's assume you are convinced and you're saying, well, let me, let me give that a try and sort of get my hands dirty. You can get started pretty much with zero installation. You don't have to do anything. Um, just uh, sign into our HDF Kida lab, which gives you a Jupyter lab type environment uh, that has all the HDF5 dependencies pre-installed. And it also has plenty of examples. In this case, uh, Jupyter notebooks, but also shell scripts and things, uh, or Python scripts. Uh, that you can use and that you can exercise and modify. And this is your private space, so to speak. You can go, uh, do whatever you like there and uh, nobody will interfere or make changes with your environment. The next step is uh, you, you probably have your preferred environment and it's very likely that uh, the community has just the right uh, packaged, built, uh, ready for you. Uh, obviously, uh, the Python folks are very organized about this with pip and conda or whatever your favorite uh, package manager is. Likewise, in Julia or in R, uh, you can get the R HDF5 package, for example, from Bioconductor. And if you are uh, more interested in sort of query type interfaces, I recommend you take a look at um, uh, HDFQL, which is a very interesting project, and you can download installers for Mac, uh, Windows, and obviously Linux uh, uh, from HDFQL.com. And for H5CPP, uh, you can get the Debian RPM packages uh, from the H5CPP homepage. Next slide, please. Okay, here are some general I.O. references. I mentioned FIO already, a very interesting tool. I, even if you are not planning on doing any uh, I.O. benchmarking yourself, just to understand what that tool is capable of doing, I think is worthwhile uh, taking a look at. So looking at the documentation, which is hosted on Read the Docs, it's very accessible, very interesting mentioned IRR, but then if you are a little more into your saying, well, these are really more low-level 
things that are synthetic that that are not really applications there's a very interesting um, uh, uh, performance analysis tool called Maxio or the multi-purpose application centric scalable IO proxy application um, that uh, resembles uh, that has greater resemblance uh, to a real application than some of these other benchmarks and it also has several backends so there is an HDR5 backend but there are also backends for other um, uh, output formats and and uh, storage layers and uh, so that makes it extra interesting so if you would like to compare let's say you are using uh, one of the maxio the non hdf5 maxio backends already and you are saying well um, uh, how much faster or what would change if i would uh, go with an hdf5 based backend then uh, this is a good starting point and then last but not least i think uh, the virtual institute for io sort of the hosts of the Top 500 for I.O. or I.O. 500 uh, is, again, a great resource um, in this space. Next slide, please. This is just a quick overview of uh, webinar topics that we have in preparation, and I'm going to speak about all of them. I'm just going to pick some. So one of them, I think, that might be of interest to a lot of you in the HPC context, but also even uh, without HPC, uh, uh, HDF5 for the cloud. We've covered that in the past, but it's a fast-moving field. So, and uh, we will have an update for you there. Um, concurrency is a hot topic. Concurrency doesn't mean only um, sort of process, MPI process, or otherwise multi-process based concurrency, but also threading in particular. So that's a good one coming up. And then um, if you are into extensions, um, uh, and these extensions uh, could be in different areas, uh, we have a webinar uh, in preparation for that as well albeit that that is really more of an advanced topic when you think about targeting and at the moment exotic storage that become might become more mainstream in the future but hdf is really very extensible and you don't have to wait uh, for someone else to make use of that storage um, with hdf5 right now if you know how to extend the library but then also uh, compression plugins or if you would like to add um, extensions to uh, for uh, profiling performance diagnostics beyond the tools beyond what the tools can give you today then there are apis extensions apis extension apis for all of those available and we would talk about that uh, during a webinar like that next slide Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for coming once again, but I would also like to thank uh, the sponsors that um, have encouraged us to uh, put material like this together and have events like this, uh, the ECP project. And uh, yeah, uh, all we can do is thank them for that and hope that um, the users, at least the users of the ECP, effort uh, find this presentation useful and uh, look forward to future webinars. Next slide, please. I think we are into questions now. Yeah, so I'm Laurie Cooper and I will uh, facilitate a couple of the questions here. Garib, you'll probably be the one to answer these. So real quick, a little homework here. Um, Someone asked about the slides. They are already posted on the forum at forum.hdfgroup.org. So you'll be able to access those and get some of the links that Garrett's put in here. Um, so Garrett, your first question for running in parallel, do you need to do a custom install of HDF5 or do the pre-built binary distributions already have that capability enabled? Um, I would say if you are using um, one of the ECP machines, for example, but also other sort of traditional uh, data center and supercomputing installations, typically the vendor will have, uh, I, I don't have to name any names, will have a build, a module, uh, let's say, uh, 
available that you can just load with module load or spec or whatever the package manager is that they use. And that's a good starting point. Um, there might be still reasons why you might want to build your own, but then uh, we can we, we will gladly assist you in building that. And there's plenty of documentation uh, on how to do that. But I, I think the first port of call would be look at your vendors, uh, what, what they provide you. And then uh, if that's, uh, I understand that sometimes, okay, uh, we are at 110.5, I believe right now, or 110.6 or 112 even for HDF5. Um, if, if the versions are a little older, then uh, it might be worthwhile considering upgrading to a newer version. But again, there's plenty of documentation. And if you have problems, just uh, post something on the forum and somebody will jump in and help you. And for anyone else that has a question, please feel free to use the questions section of GoToWebinar or email help at hdfgroup.org or go to support.hdfgroup.org. Right now, I just have one more question. Um, is it possible to use HDF PETA for HPC and MPI applications? Um, the person says it would be interesting to be able to do that in the cloud on Azure or AWS. Um, yes, it, it is certainly possible. Um, I, I personally have not done it lately, but uh, Stephen Barker and I uh, tried and demonstrated it at ISC, the, the sort of the European SC uh, last year. And uh, so, yes, it's certainly possible. And um, yeah, uh, check it out. I, that's all I can say. Okay, and another question was just, will it be posted as a video? Yeah, that will probably be early next week. We'll get that online and put that on the forum, which is forum.hdfgroup.org. So um, if there are any other questions that come in, we will try to answer those and post those on the forum or communicate with the asker directly. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it back to Elena to close up for us then. Thank you. First, thank you, Gerd, for your presentation, and I encourage everyone to send us questions to join forum and uh, send email to help at hdfgroup.org. Uh, and stay tuned for more webinars. Uh, on 26th, we will, an uh, announcement will come soon. We will uh, have a webinar for more advanced users who already use the HDF5 and want to tune the parallel applications. We'll be talking about nodes that exist in HDF5 library for tuning applications and especially for uh, DOE platforms, ECP platforms. So thank you.